believer in the prophetic saying, none of you truly believe until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. I think Dr. Hani is one of the great philanthropists, one of the great humanitarians of our current times. Dr. Hani El Banna, for services to Islamic relief. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, dear viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm happy as always to meet you in this episode of dialogue with Dr. Hani uh, El Benna, who uh, has great experience in charitable and humanitarian work. We are, uh, as you know, talking about the forum Global Dimensions of Humanitarian Work which were held in Istanbul at the end of last month. And we also uh, talk about Dr. Hani's valuable guidance and visions on other topics and on multiple experiences. Uh, in this episode, the discussion will focus on Mr. Waddah Khamfar's lecture, The Current International Balance of Power and its Reflection on the future of humanitarian and societal and social work. Dr. Hani, welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Allah yibarak fiik. Happy as always to learn from you, uh, to learn from the best. And uh, uh, let's uh, start first with some of the activities you attended during the past week. Uh, this was a uh, Orphans Federation conference in Istanbul, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which was reflecting the sixth anniversary mm -hmm. of the Federation. And uh, mostly uh, those children, the photographs, are Syrian orphans in Istanbul, mm -hmm. but there are many, many of them inside Syria. This is another uh, group of volunteers from Canada and it's also orphans from Syria. This is the volunteers from Canada coming with a program called Inspire to take the young volunteers, Canadian volunteers, bring them to different countries like Bosnia, like uh, South Africa, like Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And this is some of the orphans singing. Uh, some of the songs for the children. Here, as we can see, your mm -hmm. yeah. the parental presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, well, they have been here since Sunday. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, what, seven days now, or six days. And uh, today was the last day, and everybody would be leaving on Sunday. Mm -hmm. I'm playing with the children. There was two groups of children, children from uh, Syria, as well as children, another group, children from uh, uh, Igor from China, but uh, they wouldn't have them on the film. Uh, there was another group. So these are some of the activities that uh, organizations are using the civil liberty space in Turkey, in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. and come to meet and come to organize workshops, conferences, dialogue, and all these sort of things. And uh, one of the things in Turkey now, Turkey has at least uh, five to six million refugees, mm -hmm. uh, maybe political or maybe refugees like the people come from Syria, mm -hmm. uh, from Yemen, from other countries and uh, enjoying uh, the civil liberty space. Even hundreds and hundreds of Syrian organizations being registered, as well as others from uh, Egypt, from Iraq, uh, from Yemen, uh, from, other, uh, from Somalia, uh, from uh, other countries are registering their organization there uh, to help their own countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, uh, let me ask you, Dr. Hani, uh, on the subject of uh, orphans, 
what is your assessment of the experiences of orphan care in Arab and uh, Islamic organizations? And what are the ways to improve this field? It is very traditional, unfortunately, extremely traditional. Uh, the amount of money is provided by the donor to the orphans is minimum, cannot uh, be sufficient to cover the cost of life for a child with his mother. Mm -hmm. $50 or $60 is, is minimum, you cannot uh, uh, do that. And using the word sponsorship with kafala is not right. Mm -hmm. uh, kafala means that actually you look after the child as much as you look after your own children. Mm -hmm. Your daughter, your son. And this is what has been mentioned in the Holy Quran to Maryam. Kafala has a career. Mm -hmm. Kafala, and he was treating her like his daughter, his own daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, this is the kafala. But if you want to say supporting orphan, you can even give one. Uh, dirham, one real, one dinar, whatever mm -hmm. it is. But to call kafala, you have to treat the orphan like your own children. Mm -hmm. This is number one. Number two, which is still very traditional, mm -hmm. it is uh, putting uh, orphans in orphanage, which is out of date. Out of date in a sense, yani it is isolating uh, the child from the greater community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is number one. So you can provide the child with everything, but he is not exposed to the difficulty of life in the community itself, mm -hmm. which will create a very vulnerable and weak children. This is mm -hmm. number one. Number two, sometimes the carer in this kind of dormitories or orphanages mm -hmm. abuse the children, whether they are girls or boys. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Western organization stopped uh, having to build this kind of uh, orphanages mm -hmm. and they support the families now as a, as a, as a support family scheme mm -hmm. or as uh, giving the money to the mother or to the carer of the child mm -hmm. and keeping the child with his relatives or mm -hmm. with his mother. Mm -hmm. So this is the two problems which are facing our work with the mm -hmm. orphans uh, in the Arab and the Islamic world or the Arab and the Islamic organization. And please, uh, my advice to the donor, actually building orphanages create a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Create a lot of problems. We had an organization in UK in whom they were sponsoring uh, some of these orphanages. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, uh, at the end of the day, they discovered uh, child mm -hmm. abuse by some mm -hmm. of the carers to the girls and to the boys. And the organization was closed in uh, this country, as well mm -hmm. as the organization in UK actually was investigated by the Charity Commission because of the lack of uh, safeguarding policy mm -hmm. inside this organization. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, back to Professor Waddah Khanfar's lecture, the current international balance of power and its reflection on the future of humanitarian and societal work. Uh, some might say that uh, this issue is political and that uh, charitable organizations should not be concerned with it on the grounds that they are bound by neutrality and uh, other working values. What do you say, Dr. Hani, in this regard, uh, on what basis was this topic programmed in the forum? First of all, if I like to remind those people of saying this political, yes, it's political. I believe it's political. There's no harm of uh, listening to political views and how the political views affecting the charitable and humanitarian work in the field. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, the work of humanitarian workers and social work in the field is uh, cross-cutting with all the dimensions of the society, whether it's political, uh, economical, uh, social, educational, theological, religious, historical, mm -hmm. uh, media, art, all this, because 
this kind of organization deal with the needs of human beings. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, most of the workers in the humanitarian field and social field understand politics even more than politicians because they are exposed to this kind of different uh, problems and they understand from the feeling or the needs of the community the the causes of the problem whether it's political or economical mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the solution for such a problem mm -hmm. so uh, we put it intentionally because mm -hmm. any uh, political changes in a country affect humanitarian work mm -hmm. any economical changes in a country affects humanitarian work any social change in a country affects humanitarian work any religious changes in a country affects humanitarian work Mm -hmm. and so on, or any, any philosophical change in the understanding of the lifestyle in the country affect mm -hmm. humanitarian work. So mm -hmm. we don't want to be like an, the ostrich, Naama, which mm -hmm. she hides her head in the sand and the rest of his body is appearing. Yes, it's political, but we need to understand politics. We need to mm -hmm. understand the opinions of those people to avoid falling in the trap. Uh, let me take you, I'll give you an example, if I have the time to give you the example. Okay, go on. In, two, in 2003, I met with a British ambassador in Riyadh, mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia. And they were discussing the causes of terrorism at that time in his yeah. office. And I told you as governments, not, not Britain, I mean the, the, the governments were the causes behind this said, no, it is you, I said, let, take, let me take you back to the mm -hmm. crisis or the conflict of uh, Afghanistan, Soviet Union at the end of the 70s till the beginning of the 90s. And mm -hmm. uh, let me tell you that you people used to get visa mm -hmm. for the Mujahideen to come and raise funds from your own country, from mm -hmm. France, from Belgium, from Holland, from United States of America, from Germany. And the, the, those in these conferences, uh, people were raising funds for uh, military equipment. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you that some other governments from the Middle East were giving 50% discount mm -hmm. to the Mujahideen who are traveling to Afghanistan at that time. And let me tell you something that some of those Mujahideen or some people who have been called names later on or classified actually were coming to raise funds from the rulers of this area and after all this trap you made for the organization you tell me that you are a political or you are mixing military or whatever it is it's mm -hmm. you people what well, interests you politically you use the social and humanitarian organization what well, does mm -hmm. not interest you it, it does not suit you so what mm -hmm. happened after that not to those people who are involved in the fight but to the people who are really doing a lot of humanitarian work in Pakistan and Afghanistan mm -hmm. at the time, when they came back to their own countries in the Middle East, they were captured from the airport and put in the prison. Mm -hmm. So here, when those politicians uh, plan something, uh, they can use mm -hmm. the organization for that. My advice is don't listen to the politicians and follow their footsteps. Mm -hmm. Don't mm -hmm. listen to the political desire. Be neutral, be focused, and be clear. Mm -hmm. And be independent from the politicians. Mm -hmm. Because politicians will never support you when you do a mistake. Mm -hmm. This is my view. Uh, uh, Professor Waddah Khanfar, in his lecture, uh, spoke about a general state of confusion in the international, regional, and local scene at all levels, politically, economically, and even uh, uh, intellectually. He said, uh, for example, there is an unprecedented state of confusion. He said also, uh, the compass in the Islamic world is missing. Do you first, Dr. Hani, agree with this characterization and how does this situation affect humanitarian and societal work, social work? He is right. If you look at the quality of the leadership uh, in the good old days, 50, 60 years ago, 
uh, whether we agree with their political drive or not, it's beside the point. And you look at the quality of the leadership nowadays in different parts of the world. There's big, big, big gap mm -hmm. between people who had vision, who had knowledge, who had care for the co co community and the country, even if we don't agree with their, with their politics. Mm -hmm. Now, leadership becomes extremely weak and mm -hmm. confused because most of the political decision is governed or, or actually directed or controlled mm -hmm. by the war on terror. And the mm -hmm. war on terror makes leaders to be scared and have mm -hmm. what we call in, uh, in medical terminology to wet their underwear or to have knee-jerk effect. Mm -hmm. Okay? This is exactly what's happening here and there. Look at the mm -hmm. quality of the people in Europe mm -hmm. and the quality of the people in America. And look at the quality of the people in the 50s and 60s in the same countries. Absolute mm -hmm. big difference. The mm -hmm. same in the Middle East, the same in Asia, the same in Africa. Absolute difference. This creates a big confusion because of the lack of, of ability of the, the leaders to create a decision. Mm -hmm. uh, this is number one. Number two, the weakness of the United Nations as a member state organization. Be mm -hmm. Not because the United Nations is, a, is not a good organization, it's a good organization, but because of the, the member state, the, the state, uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the state themselves, especially of the, the Security Council and the resolutions, as well as the use of the veto system is mm -hmm. becoming a big obstacle to, mm -hmm. against any decision which has been taken in, in, in this uh, way. So when you look at this, not only on the political field, look at the quality mm -hmm. of arts, the quality of uh, culture, the mm -hmm. quality of fashion, the quality of food that we eat, Mm -hmm. the quality of uh, vehicles, of drive, the quality of uh, drama and uh, cinema and uh, acting and poetry and media and, 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 and. It is mm -hmm. very, very much less, far less qualities than the qualities of the people who had stronger moral values in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and 60s from the last centuries. It is not affecting only, the, the confusion is not affecting also only the, um, the political field, it's mm -hmm. affecting all the diff education, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even education, and even uh, changing history, and uh, making the, the devils, the bad people, good people, and the good people, bad people, as you can see how the media portray uh, some of the good people who try to defend their own countries and because of political reasons of certain leaders, so the media will make them uh, actually like demon, unfortunately. This is not only affecting the political field, that's why I say um, uh, Professor uh, Waddah was right, because this is, this is a global status mm -hmm. of confusion. Mm -hmm. And because of the lowering the moral value, the, uh, the, the ethical values, and all these sort of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, uh, some of the laws related to humanitarian and charitable institutions today were the result of political uh, events and interactions. You mentioned the, the war on terror. Yeah. Uh, for, for example, as a result of, of this war, laws against terrorism and money laundering uh, were enacted and uh, the establishment of uh, FATF uh, institutions whose tasks are to evaluate countries and their compliance with these standards. And this was uh, reflected in financial transfers dealing with local partners and, uh, and others. In your opinion, uh, Dr. Hani, do these laws have a positive or negative impact on charitable and humanitarian work? And what do you, do you think of uh, those who uh, think that uh, uh, 
they are just reasons to restrict humanitarian work, especially uh, Islamic humanitarian work. Uh, to be very honest, let me say something. I am with any regulation to control money laundering, to stop supporting terrorist organization, mm -hmm. to stop supporting radicalism, extremism, and uh, terrorism. I'm with this. Mm -hmm. uh, to support uh, any, uh, any law that actually prevent oppression, prevent injustice, mm -hmm. and bring fairness and equality to everybody. Any regulation to bring transparency and make all the activities of the organization transparent, whether it's political or economical or agriculture or social or humanitarian or whatever you call it. I am with this to start with. But sometimes these laws could have been, as you mentioned rightly, created to slow down organizations from developing, mm -hmm. to put a lot of uh, paperwork which make the officers in the organization to spend a lot of money, mm -hmm. a lot of effort, a lot of time to prepare this reporting uh, inside the reporting mechanism that been created. Mm -hmm. Needless to say that the, the, some other organization have been created to classify individual. Some mm -hmm. ex-military, uh, ex-security, ex, -security, ex uh, intelligence officers are in these organizations mm -hmm. and they are actually studying individuals and organization globally and classifying them you know how they classify them they find somebody writing something bad about them so they can put them in this category or this category or this category without making proper investigation so you wake one day in the morning and you find your list, your name is on the list being made by this organization which is credible to the countries, to the mm -hmm. institution. So here, once you found your name there or you do not understand that your name, your name there, the, uh, the banking system will start stopping your uh, bank transfer or mm -hmm. start to uh, close your bank account, whether you are an individual or you are a company or you are a charitable organization. So there's organization which is classifying people. I think they have on the list now more than three, four million people on the list and organization and institution. Then after that, once the banking system go and make the search and found the name, your name or name of the organization is there, so they start to close your organization down. Even if their name is not there, and, the, and this uh, banking uh, managers uh, will find that you are trying to send money to countries which are in conflict, like Syria, like Yemen, like Sudan, like Afghanistan, mm -hmm. they might come and tell you, okay, fine, we're going to close your bank account down within a month or two without making any reason, and you cannot have any answer from them, why did they close their bank account as individual or as company or as organization? Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example uh, to, you know, Afghanistan and how difficult is the situation there, mm -hmm. the humanitarian situation there, how many about the whole country are in dire need for assistance. Still, mm -hmm. still the transfer of money to Afghanistan is a big problem. Still cashing your money from the bank, from your bank, mm -hmm. is becoming a big problem. The local bank in Afghanistan does not allow you to even cash your own money, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. to receive your own money from your organization afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you this example which happened to us. While we were organizing this uh, meeting uh, last month, we have our organization and trying to donate 6,000 euro to us, very small amount mm -hmm. from Europe to Europe. It was mm -hmm. stopped. And despite the fact, mm -hmm. the purpose and the cause 
of that was very clear. It was not in millions, and it was in Europe, not to Afghanistan, not to Pakistan, not to Sudan, not to Somalia, not to Yemen, not to Syria. It's from Europe to Europe. It stopped mm -hmm. it. And we have to fight back for a few weeks to bring the money. This is what's happening. A smaller organization in France, because they started to work with another international one in, uh, in uh, Palestine and mm -hmm. in Sudan, uh, the bank manager sent the message that they're going to close your, your, your bank account down uh, within a month. Try to find yourself another bank. This was happening mm -hmm. really. So it becomes very difficult to find mm -hmm. that actually the bank manager himself or herself are the people because they are scared for their future, they are scared for their position, they are scared mm -hmm. for the, actually their uh, job. They stop mm -hmm. this kind of transfer. Because mm -hmm. they might say in five years time or whatever it is, people might discover that actually this money has fallen in the wrong hands, actually, and I, want, and I was the one who signed up this bank transfer. So it becomes very difficult for the Muslim charities. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, definitely there is uh, much work to do uh, because uh, these laws are uh, obviously reasons to restrict uh, humanitarian work. What uh, charitable and humanitarian work can do uh, in this situation, I mean? In this situation, the only thing that they can do is they can come together. Mm -hmm. They can build a coalition. They can stand together to make a statement to try to change the law. Mm -hmm. They can lobby governments. Mm -hmm. They can lobby the American government. They can lobby the British government. They can lobby uh, the French government. They can lobby the Canadian government. They can lobby all of them. Mm -hmm. But you cannot lobby these governments alone as an individual organization. You have to sit down together and strategize how can you make this lobbying to mm -hmm. lobby these governments and try to have a research-based evidence of your uh, argument when mm -hmm. you start to raise the flag high and say this is affecting the life of people in different parts of the world. Without mm -hmm. sitting together and building partnership, making coalition, uh, find partners amongst other governments which can agree with you to help you, mm -hmm find other organizations, whether local organization or national organization or regional organization or international organization to book this kind of lobbying process to affect mm -hmm. the decision which could be made by God. I give you an example, actually, mm -hmm. uh, which happened with the United Nations. Actually, Regarding getting the food to go to, uh, or the aid material to go to Syria from mm -hmm. the border of Turkey, there are 13 countries in the room in the uh, United Nations. Mm -hmm. 11 of them mm -hmm. were with the decision of getting the food inside. Mm -hmm. Two of them abstained, yani did not vote. Mm -hmm. And the last one, which was uh, one of the, the member state of the Security Council, <coughs> objected. Mm -hmm. So one against 12 or 13 organ uh, countries uh, stopped the decision. And this is how this could affect because of the power of the veto in the United Nations and, and the, of, of the member of the Security Council of the, of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, among the important signs and keys that Mr. Waddah explained in his lecture uh, is that we live in a moment of openness to ideas and solutions. Uh, he said openness is now possible and it is an opportunity. He said also, uh, this openness leads to human communication and sharing of experiences. He also spoke of the best investment. Uh, he said, uh, now 
the best investment is investing in young people and helping them develop. What is your comment, Dr. Hani, on uh, on that? Uh, says. Okay, regarding openness and communication, it is clear. Mm -hmm. With uh, uh, technological revolution, with the social media, multiple social media platforms, mm -hmm. with the strong telecommunication system, with the high advanced technology, yes, what happened in China or in Latin America mm -hmm. at five o'clock, it reaches you five minutes after that. Mm -hmm. We have to use these facilities to disseminate mm -hmm. our messages, to mm -hmm. reach other people, to educate mm -hmm. them in their own local languages. Actually, it is the, 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 this open and uh, world is becomes very, very important for organization to use this space. Mm -hmm. Sometimes governments stop you from entering its country or their countries that right no visa mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and sometimes they arrest people at the border without any reason but mm -hmm. with the zoom and with other uh, social media means you can reach hundreds of thousands of people in these countries mm -hmm. and my advice here to such security i tell them uh, please use your uh, artificial intelligence or emotional intelligence to understand that such a scholar or such a scientist or such mm -hmm. a learned man or woman will reach mm -hmm. your own people, whether you like it or not, whether he comes to your own country or not. Mm -hmm. This is one thing, talking about the openness. Talk about actually the communication. Now you are uh, in Morocco and mm -hmm. I'm in UK or I am in Istanbul or I am in Cairo, mm -hmm. okay? In this space, you meet me and people are listening to me while I'm talking to you, whether I speak in English or French or German or Chinese or Arabic or mm -hmm. there's yeah. audience are listening to you without mm -hmm. costing you uh, money to travel from Morocco to China or Morocco mm -hmm. to That's South right. Africa or Morocco to uh, 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 United States of America. This mm -hmm. is very important that for every young officer or every individual working in the maternal field or social field to use this facility to reach mm -hmm. the people and mm -hmm. to empower the people, to educate the people, to mm -hmm. uh, support the people and to raise funds for the people and to lobby for the people. This is regarding the open space and actually mm -hmm. the communication. Regarding mm -hmm. the second point, which is investing in youth, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely. And here my message is, uh, Mr. Dr. Uh, Hamadi, mm -hmm. for those people who are in the organization for the last 30 years, please, enough is enough. You have, of mm -hmm. course, the 60, of course, the 70, and you have not prepared any generation to come, to lead after mm -hmm. you. Why you are staying in the organization for 30 years, for mm -hmm. 20 years, for 40 years, for 25 years, for 15 years? Why? Where is the succession planning? How can you prepare mm -hmm. the second generation from young graduates and from young graduates who are either male or female in your own country and other countries? How can you bring them and train them and make them to be a part of the decision making process? Mm -hmm whether in the executive role or in the advisory role. So because we need those young people, we need mm -hmm. three or four components in any organization, on the executive level, as well as on the board of trustees level. On the executive mm -hmm. level, we need men, senior, we need young people, mm -hmm. then we need women. You tell me, yes, you understand, I understand that why we need men, because men are wiser than young women. Than, than young people and women. I said, yes, could be debatable, but I accept your argument. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, I bring young people because of their energy, because of their speed, mm -hmm. because of their dreams, 
because of the drive which I don't have as an old man. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. I will bring the woman to the table of the decision maker because of her different culture or different attitude of dealing with these problems. She is more considerate. She is more mm-hmm. emotional. She is more co- uh, uh, loving and caring. And I need mm-hmm. in the organization the young people who have the energy and they need the people who have the love and the care and the compassion as well. And they need the wise people. So I put the three of them together mm-hmm. in different level on the executive role as well as on the board's level as well. So I need mm-hmm. the three of them. That's why from the beginning of the creation of the organization, the founders mm-hmm. should realize and be aware that they should be uh, accompanied by younger generation, male and female, to mentor them, to coach them, to train them, and to prepare them. I give you an mm-hmm. example which happened to Islamic Leaf when I was there. Mm-hmm. The people who made the success story of Islamic Leaf in the 90s and late 80s were not from one cultural background, were not mm-hmm. from one racial background or not from one uh, uh, ethnic background or uh, uh, even theological background, religious background, mm-hmm. from, or not from the same age. Mm-hmm. Okay? Most of them, the decision makers at the beginning of the 90s, were less than 30 years old. Mm-hmm. And they make a big difference. One of them was from Eritrea, one of them was or two of were from, originally from Yemen, one of mm-hmm. them was originally from India, was a revert to Islam, uh, one of them was Irish, Egyptian, one of them was Egyptian, and one of them was Lebanese. Mm-hmm. And these six people, who were the real people who made this big jump of Islamic leaf at the beginning of the 90s, mm-hmm. okay? The, pre- the period before that, which is from 85 to 90, were mm-hmm. the young second school students. Most of them mm-hmm. were Asian. Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, actually, and some Arabs. Mm-hmm. So when you look at, uh, over the last nearly 40 years, six C- uh, chief uh, CEO and uh, chief executive officers mm-hmm. run the organization. First one was myself, who was, mm-hmm. I was the founder or co-founder. Second one was somebody who was half Irish, half Egyptian. Third one was originally Yemeni, the young people who have been brought up in, in the country. And number four was Egyptian. Number five was Eritrean from Eritrea. Number Mm -hmm. six nowadays, which is originally from Pakistan. And all those people uh, who are running the organization started inside the organization at mid-20s, late-20s. Some of them are very early 30s, very young. But Mm -hmm. they went to the kitchen from an early age to be prepared to become a leader after Mm -hmm. 20 years or 15 years. Well, uh, let me mention that you have as much energy and dreams as the young uh, people, if not more. Uh, you said at the end of uh, this lecture, I mean, uh, Mr. Waddah Khamfar's le- lecture, we must be part of the countries in which we live, whether they are Eastern or Western. We are the owners of values and cause and therefore we must be present in global issues. What is, uh, Dr. Hani, your guidance to charitable and humanitarian institutions through this message? Well, we came to the West as a migrant community. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the West gave us the opportunity to build our organizations. We should not be living in the West as alien, Mm -hmm. coming from different planet, in ghettos, 
isolating ourselves from the main stream or the, the from the greater society. We should not. This number one. Number two, we should work as we are the citizen of this country. Mm -hmm. Care for what happened to its own people. Start to have some program to build or to affect or to help the native population of the country. Whether they mm -hmm. are in Britain, in Belgium, in Holland, in USA and others. Mm -hmm. So another way, we should not be seen as we are foreigners in, their own, in these countries. And our program, some part of our program, mm -hmm. could be done to help the local needy in such countries. You might say that I'm an international organization and there are more needs outside. Yes, I have no problem with this, but I'm saying that you have to start to organize a local program mm -hmm. to support the vulnerable community in the host country or in the country that you immigrated to. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's 5% or 10% or 15% or whatever mm -hmm. you have as a part of your plan to while you are sending money abroad, you don't mm -hmm. forget to send money or to uh, to spend money on the local community. Mm -hmm. Let me give you two examples what happened. One during Haiti uh, earthquake uh, in Haiti, 25 mm -hmm. or 22 Muslim organization responded. Mm -hmm. and even some of them build schools and spend millions of dollars in, uh, on the people in Haiti. Mm -hmm. When the Ukraine conflict happened a few months ago, I was begging some organizations in the West mm -hmm. to stand up for Ukrainian. They said, all the European and American governments are supporting them financially. I said, okay, fine. I have no problem. Stand up to try to advocate for the cause of the needy people who became internally displaced mm -hmm. or they became refugees in the neighboring countries. They refused. Maybe one or two or three countries sent their delegation to Poland, no, no, uh, to, Poland to Hungary, mm -hmm to distribute some very small items and to send a message of solidarity. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm saying. There's a lot of elderly need help in these countries. Mm -hmm. A lot of, this, a lot of uh, uh, homeless need help in this country. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, people living alone, actually, or children, or vulnerable street children living in this country as well. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things which the government would love to partner with yourself to help this uh, vulnerable community of these countries. That's why what I said at, the, at, the, at my statement, yes, consider yourself a citizen, a French, a Spanish, a German, a, a Italian, a American, Canadian, a British. Uh, so the British government will see that you are not uh, isolating your community from the ministry. Mm -hmm. This is regarding uh, the, the question of uh, uh, being responsive mm -hmm. and responding to the local needs in these countries. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. Hani, uh, allow me now to uh, present uh, some of the comments of our followers on Facebook pages. Uh, uh, Sousan uh, commented, uh, uh, she said, uh, the security aspects played um, a major role in disturbing youth initiatives and local institutions in Yemen. That's right. Uh, we have also uh, from uh, Khadija Saleh from Tunisia, uh, she said in some Arab and Islamic countries, charitable work is under siege, especially if those in charge of it are Islamists under the pretext of financing terrorism and money laundering. Yeah, okay. Your, your comment, Dr. Hani. Both of them are right. Mm -hmm. For more than one reason. For the mm -hmm. first one from Yemen, because with an initiative, with a startup organization which does not have a history, mm -hmm. 
they don't have enough experience, people will be scared to fund them mm -hmm. because of the lack of experience, the lack of financial regulation, the lack mm -hmm. of financial reports in this organization. Okay? And mm -hmm. it's new to the field and to the donors. That's why there's let's be scared. Mm -hmm. The second question also from Khadija is mm -hmm. right. I mentioned to you the civil liberty space in Turkey and how it allowed Syrian mm -hmm. refugees and uh, mm -hmm. Yemenis mm -hmm. and uh, Egyptians and others to build their own social and humanitarian organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we did, which does not affect the political uh, system. Mm -hmm. In these uh, other countries, for the Arab uh, countries, unfortunately, this civil liberty space became very, very small or mm -hmm. absent sometimes. Does not exist. Because mm -hmm. what? Because the state is supporting one man mm -hmm. called the president or called the king or called the sheikh or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So it's not supporting the, the, the people of the country. That's why the security and the intelligence are so scared that actually mm -hmm. the civil society organization would create a local leadership to challenge the political system and mm -hmm. its corruption. Both are right. And thank Sister Khadija from, uh, I don't know, from Khadija uh, Saleh, and thank the other sister as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the third comment uh, from uh, Ahmed Hamid al uh, from Egypt, he said, uh, workers in the field are the real guarantee for the production of the outputs of humanitarian work and the accurate measurement of needs, but they suffer from conflict with managers. Yes, absolutely. First of all, the local staff are the most experienced in any organization, mm -hmm. in any international organization, because they know the problem, they know the causes, they know mm -hmm. the solution. Mm -hmm. But because they are local, sometimes the headquarter, which could be in Europe or America or some rich Arab countries, might not mm -hmm. accept this. Mm -hmm. It becomes too difficult for them to accept that. How on mm -hmm. earth did this man or this woman who are living in this backward country tell us what to do? Okay, mm -hmm. this is the mentality of the individual, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. That's why the local staff, Ahmed al Hit is a humanitarian and social worker, and he is right, absolutely right of what he said. Mm -hmm. Regarding the relationship between the, uh, the, 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 the leaders or the managers or the directors and the staff, Mm -hmm. A lot of those managers or directors or CEOs, do, 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 a lot of them do not uh, tolerate mm -hmm. the challenge which could be presented to them from the staff, mm -hmm. whether they are local or with them in their own country in the head field. Well, this is happening. And this will force, unfortunately, such an individual to, to look mm -hmm. for... Uh, for uh, somebody who is much weaker mm -hmm. and what we call them, yes, minister people, or mm -hmm. yes, sir people. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Ahmed Hit is, 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 is a learned humanitarian worker. Mm, okay. Uh, uh, Yusuf uh, bin Baghdad uh, commented that uh, charitable organizations in every country must have strategic local partners and you yes. mentioned that uh, uh, helping that uh, strategic local partners and uh, uh, training them uh, and developing their skills are uh, the mission of these organizations. Uh, it becomes a compelling necessity and duty on any international organization. When they go to work 
in a country which have a lot of small uh, community organization or local organization to find partners mm -hmm. whether one or two or three or five or ten is entirely up to them to mm -hmm. train partners to empower partners to support partners and to protect partners mm -hmm. this is a part of the work of the international organization in this country Otherwise, they might stay in the country for 20, 30 years. Then when they leave, the organization will collapse. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, the last comment from uh, Hayam Al-Qadasi. Uh, she uh, commented about the economic empowerment projects. She said that uh, economic empowerment projects are important in eliminating unemployment and launching the wheel of development. She is absolutely right. Thank you, uh, Sister Hayam. You are absolutely right. Uh, if uh, Professor Hassan said, معافاً في بدنه عنده قوتة يومية كان كأنه محيدة طلاب الدنيا The one who will sleep safe in his house Have good health And have the food ration for the day Is like the one who Allah favor him on the other people in this dunya That's the hadith Okay Economic empowerment is a process, is a program, is a vision. Mm -hmm. By empowering the local community to become independent, mm -hmm. particularly the widows, the vulnerable people, the displaced people, and the poor people. The economic empowerment will let the individual himself to be able to teach his children mm -hmm will be able to look after something else in the community. Mm -hmm. So this is how local empowerment or economic empowerment is essential from day one. Mm -hmm. Not only that, creating the waqf system or the waqf scheme is absolute necessity mm -hmm. from day one. Mm -hmm. That's actually what we're talking about, economic empowerment, from Sister Hayam. Yes, I agree with you. Such economic empowerment should be given to young people, should be given to women, should be given to men. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Dr. Hani, uh, at the end of this episode, as we uh, uh, rewatch these clips of your uh, parental uh, presence, with the orphans and your participation in their uh, activities. Uh, allow me to ask you about an important point that uh, Dr. Hussein Al-Qazaz uh, uh, mentioned in his lecture. Uh, he said that we must understand uh, orphanhood in a general way that oh. is not related to the individual case only, but uh, to the state of the nation as a whole. What is your comment uh, on this approach uh, to orphanhood, Dr. Han? Yes, he is right in what he said in his lecture. Look at Europe and America nowadays. There is no orphanhood for the whole Western world, mm -hmm. because America is the father. Mm -hmm. Look at, at the time of the uh, challenge or the conflict between the West and the East, mm -hmm. actually, which ended by Gorbachev last century. There were two parents, one for the West and one for the East. Nowadays, we have got only one parent for the West, which is the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Look at the Muslim countries, who used to have a state as a parent or as a father in different parts of the world, which is covering a huge geographical area. It's not there anymore. That's why 
most of the local countries or the most of the states are treated like orphans. No father, no mother, but some children in a, uh, living in a no-go area, mm -hmm. which are the countries there. Yes, the Muslim Ummah is in a state of orphan uh, or orphanage, uh, unfortunately, living like orphans. No state is caring for them mm -hmm. and planning for them and supporting them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Hani, for this uh, interesting dialogue. Dear uh, followers, we invite you to share and comment this content. Until we meet again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you, Jazakallah khair. Wa alaikum assalamu wa barakatuh. Dr. Hani was a strong believer in the prophetic saying, None of you truly believe until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. I think Dr. Hani is one of the great philanthropists, one of the great humanitarians of our current times. Dr. Hani Elbana, for services to Islamic relief. Hani.